If I can have everyone's attention, we're going to get ready to start. So uh, this is the City of San Antonio's uh, public meeting on the Brackenridge um, draft master plan. And so uh, I'm going to ask for an announcement to be made. El anuncio es para las personas que requieran interpretación al español. Si hay alguien aquí que levante la mano y le entregue un receptor. Ok, gracias. Thank you, good evening. Uh, my name is Xavier Urrutia. I'm the director of the city of San Antonio's Parks and Recreation Department. And uh, just to make sure everyone's in the right place, uh, this is the public meeting on the draft Brackenridge Park Master Plan. Um, just a little bit of background, uh, again, I want to thank the Guadalupe for hosting us uh, here. This is uh, one of six additional meetings that we're having on the draft master plan. Uh, back last year in 20, uh, actually in 2015, uh, City Council approved funding for a uh, uh, master plan for Brackenridge Park. So the city uh, went through the procurement process and um, we grant, uh, awarded a, a group of consultants uh, that job of coming up with uh, a master plan for Brackenridge Park. And before we get into a lot of details about that, we'll kind of give you some background and some history about it, but just like I mentioned, so that plan, they've been working out on it over the last, a little bit less, than, probably less than a year, um, and talking to a lot of different groups, a lot of stakeholders, neighborhoods, but as part of that process in reviewing the draft master plan, uh, we got some additional feedback and, and I wanna recognize uh, former Councilwoman Perez Obadas here, who also brought to the attention of Councilman Trevino that really there needed to be a larger, more engaged public input process that really was really citywide. So, um, so we, appreciate, we appreciate that feedback. And uh, we took that challenge, and so we added six meetings across the city as a whole. Uh, and this is the actually third meeting of those six that we're, we're holding at different venues across the city. So um, we will be going through, again, like I mentioned, we'll kind of give you a background, and then we're gonna give opportunity for people to speak who wish to speak, but everyone has the opportunity to weigh in on how they feel about the different elements, and we'll get into some detail about that. But, before I go any further, I really wanted to, we are in District 5, and we're being hosted by Guadalupe, but also Councilwoman Gonzalez is here, and Councilman Trevino really engaged his other colleagues to say, hey, this is important. You know, Brackenridge Park is not just District 1, it's not just District 2, it's really a citywide park. And it really is one of the parks that people think of when they think of parks in San Antonio. So uh, he really worked with his other colleagues to get them to really be engaged as well and get the community out. So we're really excited that there's the number of people that are here today. And I want to give Councilman Gonzalez an opportunity to say a few words and thank her for being here. Good evening, everyone. And welcome to the historic Guadalupe Theater. So if you all have not been here in a long time, welcome back to uh, the theater or welcome back to the Guadalupe. Uh, we are, of course, proud of this beautiful theater that hosts us very, so very often, especially for uh, public events and forums like this one. And uh, I also want to thank Councilwoman uh, for bringing this to our attention and allowing us the opportunity to, uh, to weigh in on this very important part of uh, Brackenridge. Uh, I have two very small children, a two-and-a-half-year-old son and a one-year-old son, and we take advantage of our parks uh, very often. And so I go to Brackenridge Park fairly often, probably a couple of times a month. Uh, and I, I take advantage of every of the different amenities from the park. And lately, um, I've been parking at the Pearl and going for a coffee, and then walking along the trail there uh, to the playground. And then depending on how our day is going, uh, I may enjoy the playground that's free, or I may go into the zoo and spend a little time there, uh, ride the train, uh, and, and then enjoy the shade of the beautiful park and the trails inside uh, the park. Um, and so I feel like I, 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 I'm just here to listen. Uh, I enjoy our park very much the way it is, and I know that there has been some feedback on wanting to maintain it just the way it is and perhaps do some 
existing uh, sprucing up or perhaps adding amenities. Um, but I, I know that I sure do enjoy the beautiful space that we have. Um, and I hope that you all give your feedback and you give your opinions about it. And, and hopefully we have feedback from all members of the community. So as a, young, as a mother with young children, uh, I do appreciate being able to go in and out very quickly to somewhere because you never know when things might fall apart very quickly. Um, and suddenly, in fact, I was there not too long ago for Ridge Park. Uh, and there was a single dad and he was there with his children and then um, I had to borrow a diaper. Well, not borrow, but I had to ask him, do you have any diapers? Because I don't, I came from the Pearl, I left the diaper bag and I need one. And so of course he was kind enough to, to uh, give me a diaper, a diaper and some wipes. Uh, but we also know that we have a very senior people as well that may enjoy walking around the park because it's shaded. And so it's one of the, the parks, one of the things that's lacking in some of our urban parks is that there's not enough shade. So we do hope to hear from all of uh, the members of our community, whether you're senior, and I know we have a group here from AARP. So thank you, AARP, <laughs> for advocating on behalf of seniors. And I'm sure there's some other parents of young children in the room who also need the flexibility to just come in and out of a park uh, without too much commitment of staying very long. Uh, and then, of course, people who just love the area because it's, it's where we've grown up and where we spent all of our time. So hopefully some old users, uh, old time users, um, uh, long time users, I suppose is a better word. And then some new people who uh, are maybe experiencing it for the first time because of the revitalization of the area around the Pearl and the Mission and the River North project. So thank you all very much for being here. I'll be here for most of the event, and we'll have to leave um, after a little while, but I'm anxious to hear uh, everybody's feedback. So thank you for uh, organizing us and allowing us to be here in this beautiful theater. Thank you to the Guadalupe for having me. Thank you, Marceline. So uh, real quick before we start, I want to, and I'm looking to see if I see the consultants in the back. And I I don't know if I do. Oh, there we go. Okay. So our consultants, we have two of them here today. Uh, they will be taking notes. We also have staff here, so they will be recording what is being said. Not recording, but I mean writing notes about what's being said. Everyone also has the opportunity to, the boards in the back, give you the opportunity to place a dot on the different elements of the draft master plan that you either really like, kind of like, or neutral about, not crazy about, and really don't like, you're able to put that there. So we're trying to get a consensus of what are some of the elements that people really feel strongly about or elements that they really feel strongly against. And so everyone has that opportunity. We also have iPads in the back, so if you don't feel comfortable either speaking or you don't wanna, we also have comment cards you can put in the back. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable using comment cards, we have iPads that can you know walk you through a survey they ask certain questions about the different elements, but we have also people working the, the different uh, boards in the back. And so if there's specific questions that you have, you know, you heard about this, you, you know, you thought about this, they can help you answer, or they can help answer some of those questions that you may have. So I just kind of want to give you a big picture. So when we look at a master plan, a master plan really is a plan. It's kind of a guiding principle plan. It's not an implementation schedule. It's not a construction project. It's really a vision. It's how, where do we see Brackenridge Park going? And beyond that, in this particular case, there's no money or funding identified for anything in the master plan right now. So there's not any money to do any elements in the master plan. So I just want to be very clear, while we may have a lot of visions and dreams, and even if the public really wants to see some of those, today as we speak, there is no money identified for any improvements or any changes at Brackenridge Park. The second piece I want to share too is that the master plan does not address any programming of the park, meaning it doesn't say uh, we're going to add this, and add this program, that program. It doesn't talk about any fees. You know, there's been some rumors about charging people to go to Brackenridge or being able to camp out during Easter time. There's no mention in the master plan about fees whatsoever and the, you know, utilizing or increasing fees. And there's really not a, really anything in the master plan that talks about changing use. There is elements in the master plan that talk about changing some of the changing streets and, and parking, which ultimately could have an impact on use, 
but there's nothing that comes out. For example, you know, I've heard some at another meeting people say you're taking barbecue pits out of Brackenridge Park. Doesn't talk about taking barbecue pits out. Doesn't talk about taking picnic tables out. Doesn't talk about any any of that. Um, so it really is a, the vision in Brackenridge Park Master Plan really talks about three main things. It talks about restore, preserve, and protect. It talks about restoring a lot of the ecological features of the park. It talks about preserving a lot of the historic and cultural features of the park, and ultimately protecting those features and protecting park users in the park. So in that big vision, the consultants came up with five strategy areas, and that's what we're asking for your input today on those strategy areas. So just to kind of give you a background, those fall into, and I'm gonna read them verbatim because they're gonna be on your boards so you'll be able to see that. It's, it talks about increasing visibility and pedestrian access to and within the park. So what that really talks about is how people view the park or get to the park. So Bracken Ridge, unfortunately, is encumbered by a lot of physical barriers when you think about it. You have Avenue B at the top of Pershing, which is the big drainage ditch that kind of separate it to one section. You have Hildebrand and Stadium Drive and Alamo Stadium that kind of block it from one other angle. Then you kind of come from the south, you may have uh, the, the St. Mary's Mulberry, you know, uh, five points at, at one point, at that section there with the expressway. So one of the three recommendations is to really look at how do we address neighborhood connectivity and really a presence of the park so that like has a front door or, or when you're driving down Broadway that you feel like there's Brackenridge Park I've arrived or there, it's a destination so one of the other strategies is recapturing green space in lieu of impervious cover and parking so what that talks about today 20% of Brackenridge Park is covered with impervious cover that could be a rooftop could be a parking lot could be a sidewalk could be a building 20% of it is hardscape and so one of the things they looked at is how do we recapture some of the green space within that park so there's strategies they looked at do we maybe narrow some roads do we do we take out some parking meaning that we need to replace it with parking in other places so there's strategies to look at does it make sense to maybe add garages at the outskirts of the park or the periphery of the park and then take out parking inside the middle of the park so that's one of the things, one of the strategies that's looked at to see, is there a way to recapture green space, add back more grass, add more trees to the park? The third strategy is restoring, preserving, and articulating park cultural and historic features. So what that really talks about is, Bracken Ridge has layers and layers of history to it. It has pre-Spanish colonial history, has Spanish colonial history, has history during the Confederate, time in our history. It has a lot of history that's just layered on top of it. And so one of the strategies is looking at how do we take some of those buildings, how do we take some of those features and interpret those and make sure that people understand the history of Bracken Ridge, which is ultimately the history of San Antonio. How do we look at telling our history as a community, as a people, as San Antonians, through Bracken Ridge Park? And part of it is looking at preserving those buildings, making sure they're not falling into disrepair, are there other uses that we could find for those buildings? Meaning they, it may have been a waterworks building at one point in its history, but today maybe it's a, uh, maybe it's a conference room or maybe it's a coffee shop. Or, but looking at ideas, how do we repurpose some of those structures within the park? The fourth one is restoring natural park features, improving and improving water quality. So you think about Bracken Ridge, sometimes a lot of people forget it's around the San Antonio River. Bracken Ridge is there because of the river. And so sometimes we forget about the river, and the river ends up being almost like second thought. And so one of the things we've talked about there is how do we restore some of the natural balance? We have a lot of invasive species throughout um, the Bracken Ridge Park that really uh, kill out some of the native plants and native trees, which impair and cause erosion and then cause well, the, the water quality to diminish in Bracken Ridge Park, especially in the river through Bracken Ridge Park. We also look at Catapa Persian, which I mentioned earlier, which is this huge drainage ditch, which is concrete line. 
So one of the strategies they looked at is, do we look at an e eco restoration project? Do we look at taking that concrete ditch and making it more like the mission reach of the river? Where you add back plants and you add back trees, you bring back the fauna and the flora, you bring back animals and nature, but also make it accessible for people to use as a, as a trail, as a connector. So that's again one of the strategies, strategies you'll see on the board. And then the last one is reducing vehicular traffic to improve pedestrian mobility. So this one probably has gotten the most conversation from people, which is what we want to hear, which is really talking about not taking out the streets in Brackenridge, because ultimately, believe it or not, the streets are a historic feature of Brackenridge, but looking at possibilities of either closing off segments of the streets, pieces of the streets, or closing them off during certain times of the year. So there's a possibility that maybe they're closed, but during the holidays, like during the uh, spring break, during Easter, that those streets be open so that people can have loading and unloading. But really looking at trying to make Brackenridge more pedestrian and bicycle friendly, as opposed to just having cars going through. And I think you'll see on some of the maps in the back, we have a big problem with cut through. There is an access point from Hildebrand that people enter in the park through Hildebrand and cut and zoom down to get to Broadway so they, they can just circumvent our uh, Incarnate Word, uh, University, University of Incarnate Word and the Broadway light. So that's one of the things they look at is maybe closing up one street or two streets might be a solution to see about trying to manage traffic within Bracken Ridge so that it is safe and friendly for families and kids who want to be walking around and running around and give them more opportunity to be able to do that. So those are, the, those are the five strategy areas that were really looked at part of the draft master plan. So like I mentioned, there's no funding yet associated with anything. Nothing's been finalized. We're doing input meetings across the city. We ultimately will go to council committee just to present recommendations. And those recommendations, the way I'm envisioning, will look twofold. One would be, of course, we have our consultants, which are subject matter experts in the area. I mean, you really think about you know, landscape architects, architects, these are some individuals from some well-known firms in San Antonio. Actually, it's a team from five, I think, three different firms that are very well-known in San Antonio, maybe four. I'm trying to think of it off the top of my head, but uh, one in San Antonio. So they may have recommendations, but we will ultimately give council the full picture. My goal is to present council with, here's what, you know, kind of the, the consultants are kind of recommending, us also working with Bracken Ridge Park Conservancy, what they're kind of recommending, what staff recommends, and what the public is saying. And ultimately, hopefully, we'll have a great product that really addresses some of the visions that we want to see uh, for Bracken Ridge, but also has the integrity and the, um, the desire of what the public is. Because at the end of the day, without the public will to see anything happen, we just won't see any, we won't see any improvements. We won't see any improvements or even sustainability of the park. And we think ultimately that's what we want to see is that Bracken Ridge continue to be one of the crown jewels in our park system. So um, like I mentioned, boards are in the back. I know people may be on a schedule, so you're not required to stay to hear all the, the speakers. We will be uh, having the speakers come up one at a time. They get three minutes if you're here as an individual. If you're representing a group, meaning there's three or more of you, and you want to be heard as a group, we'll give you actually nine, nine, six or nine? Nine minutes for a group, because we want to make sure you hear everything you have to say. Um, we have to say we have staff that are recording, are taking notes, <laughs> but if your schedule doesn't allow you to stay, please go back to the boards. We have staff already at the boards, you, we have cards, we have the iPads, we have the survey. So we don't, we don't want you to have to feel like you have to stay before, you have to stay the whole two hours to be able to your input to be heard. You can, and we want everyone, whether you speak or not, to please go put your dots. We want to see where the consensus is for some of the features that people like and some of the things that they don't like. And then that helps us, at the end of the day, report back to council and give them an overall report of, of what we you know, see uh, we, we're hearing from the community. And we're also, this is also available online. Uh, at our website at the santaneo.gov, www.santaneo.gov, if you go into Parks and Recreation. Even, even actually on the city's main page, there's an access point that talks about the Bracken Ridge Draft Master Plan. You can send your comment via email if you'd like. The copy of the Master Plan is actually there electronically if you'd like to, to read it and review it. So again, there's lots of opportunity uh, for you to give input uh, tonight and 
the next you know, into the next uh, probably into the next month. We're probably going to go another month. I think our meetings go into the early July. So um, before we start with the speakers, though, uh, I wanted to recognize and. Um, Lynn Bobbitt, Executive Director of the Breckenridge Park Conservancy, and see if she wanted to share a few words with you, and then I'll come back and we'll start um, the meeting with the speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Hello, I'm the Executive Director of the Breckenridge Park Conservancy, and I thought it would be interesting for you to hear just about the Conservancy and how it was formed. I also want to let you know that I live in District 1 and I use the park on a regular basis, not just because I'm the executive director of the Brackman's Conservancy. I'm a San Antonian. I um, have lived here all my life. I had many birthday parties in the park. I even had an alligator from the alligator garden. It has been an important part of my family's life, too. Uh, the Brackenridge Park Conservancy was formed in 2008, and it was to be the steward of and advocate for Brackenridge Park. It was to be a partner with the city of San Antonio. And we indeed have a memorandum of understanding with the city of San Antonio. It was adopted by the city council in 2009, and the Parks and Recreation Department administered the memorandum of understanding. That memorandum allows us to be an advisor to the city uh, to talk about uh, the protection of the park as the city envisions it, as well as the community. We are not an organization to tell the city what to do. We are here to be an advocate for the park itself and to actually represent you, the community. Uh, we have a website too. Uh, www.brackridgepark.org and you may go to our website it is free you find all kinds of information and galleries of photographs as well about the history of the park the net the, the park is um, on the National Register of Historic Places it is um, something as Xavier referred to in that uh, that just it, you can't walk in and change it without a lot of discussion so I too would like to say this is an opportunity for all of us to come together. San Antonio is known as a collaborative city and we've shown ourselves proud in that regard. So this is the time to speak up about what you want for your park. It is a park for the entire city, not just one district or the other. And um, I also wanted to say that the Breckridge Conservancy was formed as a result of a partnership with the city as well as the Conservation Society, the new executive director of the society is here with us tonight to hear about the park. But it was thought that with the uh, development that was going to occur and the explosive development that you see happening now, the city was very visionary and they saw the need for an organization. It is the only organization that is solely dedicated to looking after the needs of the park. And when I talk about park, I mean, the whole Brackenridge Park is about 345 acres, but that includes the zoo, that includes the witty, that includes the golf course, that includes the first tee. Only a third of that, or about 115 acres, is open and non-fee based and free to the, to the public. So it's what, what we all need to look at and decide what we want for it. So I welcome comment, input, and I'm here for the evening too to answer questions. I look forward to meeting you. Thank you, Lynn. So uh, we're going to start with our first uh, speakers. Um, questions on your background? Will you entertain questions on the background that you gave us? On, on the, for the park? The, yes. Yeah, for the park. Yes, sir. So they're, at the different stations, they can get the specific no, details. No, not on the master plan. <laughs> Let me ask the question. You mentioned that, that you had met, that this thing started 2015, and that you had met with uh, community organizations and neighborhood organizations <coughs> to get their feedback. Is there a place where we can where we can look for that feedback? Did you document their feedback? Yes, the consultants have that, so that would, they the can see that. Does the public have that? Can so, I, yes, I you can see that, sir. We, the consultants can provide that to you, yes, sir. So in the back, we'll have the consultants. Is it on the San Antonio, the, the WW? Website. Website that you, that you I'm not sure if that detail is in the draft that's on the website, but we can see. Can you please provide it? Sure. Yes, sir. Can you put it on the website? Yes, sir. Okay. So the first speaker 
is, and I apologize if I get the name wrong, uh, Gianna Rendon. Okay. Okay. Uh, then Hunter Sosi. And then he will be followed by Mikey Moore. Okay, so I'll keep my comments brief. Um, I just have a couple. So I am a student at Trinity University, which means I use Bracken Ridge all the time. It's super close. Um, I really enjoy the, the park the way it is. My classmates and I will sometimes go over. To study, we'll sit on the, the banks of the river right there in the park and study this really nice break from everything else. Uh, specifically on the limiting the use of vehicles in the park and closing off some of the roadways, um, I see people use those facilities all the time, not just like certain parts of the year. Um, every time I'm at the park, I see people park there, you know, picnicking or um, bringing out their stuff to just have a nice day at the park. And I think we should like, respect and accommodate that like historic and really unique use of the park of being able um, to be really accessible and really close to it. Um, and secondly, uh, for the people mover that's mentioned in the in the plan, to me that just it makes it seem reminiscent of like a theme park rather than a park park. And I think it just completely defeats the purpose of the park being kind of an escape from everything, and it makes it too much of a like you know touristy destination type place. It just doesn't make sense to the park. Thank you. more and she will be followed by Jean Elder. I'm Mikey Moore and I grew up in Brackenridge Park, learned how to ride a horse there and I'm 71. I go through there every day, every day. I walk two miles a day. Um, I think that it would be a good idea if you're worried about all the asphalt and the impervious cover to rip it up not limit any parking but rip up the asphalt and use pavers or use porous concrete or use grass covered streets where you mow the roads build a green grass roof at the train station instead of getting rid of that parking as far as access is concerned um, access to the neighborhoods getting to get into the park there's already plenty of access and yet you talk of restricting access by making everyone have to go into the park at Toledo, at the Toledo entrance, but then you say you want the neighborhoods to have access, and those are contradictory ideas. I don't think you should you should restrict the access into the park anywhere at all, uh, nor vehicles being allowed to go into the park. They should be allowed to continue to use it. You can fix the asphalt problem other ways than not letting any cars go in there. As far as parking concerned, there's already a lot of parking and it's all free. You have over a thousand, thank you. You have, you have over a thousand spaces, 300 of them in the shade under 281 on Toledo Drive, which by the way was named after my sister, thank you very much. And you have parking uh, at the Sunken Gardens. You have parking at the train station. All of it's free already. If you're worried about impervious cover, then tear it up and put pervious concrete or pavers or grass. Put a cover over it and let it be concrete roof and you plant it with grass. There's all kinds of ways of taking care of that problem. I'm curious how much does a garage cost? I'm curious how much Pate Dawson is gonna profit on yet another garage in our park. So I, I, I agree with this gentleman on the third row. I'd like to know where the public can easily access the feedback that you guys are getting from everybody. Let's be transparent and let the people see what other people are saying. Originally, by the way, you said uh, five or six parking garages, and now I'm reading in your thing like three or four parking garages. I think that's uncomfortable. I don't like it. Regarding the golf course, Belize comes up next year. They have butchered the trees. They have polluted the river. They have pollute, they have caused erosion up and down the river. And if you go out there right now, you'll see where they've cut all the trees and all the brush along the waterways in the, in the golf course. And that's causing erosion along the river banks and that creek that runs from the Catalpa Pershing. Make them pay for it. Make them pay back for all the trees that they've butchered, all the trees that they've lost. Or better yet, take back the golf course. Excuse me, I timed this before I did it and I'm gonna finish. 
Instead of letting the rich businessmen play golf on the golf course, let the town people who are paying their taxes use the golf course or take it back and use it back into a park. So I guess what, my last thing I would say is you already have a great lawn, grand lawn. You have the golf course, you have the driving range, you have plenty of grand lawns, use the ones you already have. And the last thing I will say is I have been driving through that park meditating in that park and enjoying that park in my car for 71 years of my life or a car and if you take away my access to my city park or these people's access to their city park you're going to open a can of whoop ass thank you you know, followed by jess mace Yes, hi, I'm Gene Elder. I live on River Road, <clears throat> and I've lived in the River Road area since the 70s, and I do uh, observe the park in, uh, many times through the years, and I, I'm concerned about uh, the talk of limiting the street access to the park. Uh, I've been told that that's not going to happen, but at the same time, you've talked about that you are going to block off the streets, and I'd like to point out that on Mulberry, between Broadway and St. Mary Street, there is no way to get off of Mulberry if there's a, a, a traffic jam, which happens regularly when people come to the uh, Sunken Garden or, or, or an event in the park, uh, or just during the weekday, if something happened, not to be able to, to leave uh, Mulberry Street, maybe possibly use the park to, to uh, you know, as an exit, is a problem also by blocking off the streets as you're thinking about you limit the ability for emergency vehicles to get into the park in case you have you know the police or an ambulance needing to get into there but actually the thing that i would like to bring up at this time since i already brought this up in today's paper um, these people movers and we have not gotten any figures on how much they cost and are, are these the pictures that you have here? Is this what's proposed to be bought? And of course, meaning that if you're buying these, you're probably wanting to build your um, parking garages outside the outside the park and move and use these to move these into the park. Is what I'm thinking you're you're, you're proposing. Uh, but I would like to. I think we should have some figures on how much these buses or people movers are costing and how much they are to maintain and the salaries of the drivers and insurance and stuff and it's just cheaper actually than just enjoying the park the old-fashioned way and just park your car thank you i have called right up again Dixon, and then after i don't want to make sure i didn't skip anyone uh it's christopher green afterwards hi i'm Jess Mays. Uh, my family actually has been in the main park area which is about uh, our house is about three blocks from there and we actually helped build a lot of the houses in that neighborhood so we've been around there about a hundred years i used to break horses in in the park so i grew up there my mom grew up there grandparents everybody uh, i'm kind of just going to go off the top i don't have a set speech or anything but i really think it's important that we take a look at who we're displacing in this because my whole neighborhood maggie park has felt the squeeze i have watched primarily mcdonald families have to move out and have to forced to move somewhere else because they can't afford their taxes. I've watched skyscrapers go in where fun places used to be. And I wonder if this uh, Brackenridge Park revitalization is just some uh, architectural firm or a collaboration between architectural firms to make money because sometimes the people don't get hurt in this. Uh, I hear things like people movers and it's just like, what is this Disneyland? This is a park for all of us to enjoy, you know? And there's examples all over the country and in other countries of parks where the people can enjoy them and parks where they're set for uh, the upper class, the rich class. This park's for everyone and I think that everyone should be heard and really be heard. And I think what he mentioned was important too. Where are these documents? I think we should be able to see what the public feedback is because it's important. Thank you. Uh, my main concern, uh, I think I'll limit it to simply the parking garages. The greatest travesty that has ever been imposed upon Breckenridge Park was the construction of a parking garage in the woodlands. That is just an eyesore 
and a wart that will need to be extracted at some point. It's got to be taken out. Now I've heard rumors that certain entities wish to build up another two stories. I've heard rumors that the old maintenance uh, facility was, was promised when that garage was built that that maintenance facility property was then going to be wooded and restored to natural habitat. It is not. Now I'm understanding it's going to be used for buses. Now I don't mind parking garages, but not one square inch of the park should have a parking garage. They should all be to the periphery outside of the property. So if incarnate word needs a garage break building, if the zoo needs one, outside they own the property, build one. If the witty needs a parking garage, go across Broadway, buy some property, and build one. Not one square inch of the park should be for parking garages. Thank you. Thank you. I have uh, Gloria Benitez, and then followed by Amy Cascadis. Hi, I've been an educator here in San Antonio for about 30 years. Have taken many, many children to the Brackenridge Park and also enjoyed it uh, myself when my family from Austin would come all the way from Austin to Brackenridge Park. One of the main things that I like about Brackenridge Park is that it's a bucolic setting. It is wooded. The children would always pretend they were in the woods when they would take the train. And I, as a child, remember my father driving us through the streets that uh, were gravel paths and just being in wonder uh, that there were picnic tables there. So I wouldn't want to see those roads closed to access because our children in the inner city don't have access to that type of setting, a bucolic setting. Uh, another thing that I'd like to address is this idea of a grand lawn. Grand lawns go back in history to about the 17th, 16th century and Europe. We keep trying to make this city in the image of a European uh, country. We're not Europe. We're actually Mexican. And there's so many positive things about being Mexican that this city seems to want to erase. Why not La Gran Llaza or the Gran Patio? You know, why not make it more relevant to this community? Lastly, it's not a neighborhood park. It's a community park. The entire community of San Antonio and beyond. Because as I said, as a child having grown up in Austin, we would leave Austin to come to Brackenridge Park. So I hope you do some changes, but minimize them to keep that bucolic feeling. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Amy Castley. Um, I just have a few comments I wanted to make. Following up in part on the, um, on the gentleman's comment about the squeeze on the neighborhood. And we know, um, and the city has not, um, has not hidden the downtown plan, but we know that the effect of that is and will be the gentrification of the downtown. In other words, the replacement of our traditional neighborhoods with more affluent, more white, more um, uh, highly paid residents. Um, and, and this issue with, with Brackenridge Park is another part of it. If we improved the south reach of the river and Mission Trails happened, because now that property is so valuable because of the improvements of the money that the city and the county put into it, it's just incredible. It's incredible to believe that the city is proposing to make improvements to Brackenridge Park a large part of which will be to keep out anybody that can't walk to the park. Isn't that just incredible? 
Instead, right, instead, what the city should be doing is making it more accessible to people who are coming from the west side or the east side or the south side. Because those people are going to have to live farther away. I'm fine if we have a parking problem to say this part, these parking facilities are available only to people who have more than one, per, only to cars that have more than one person in. What about that? What about parking for families? What about parking for more than one person? Right? What about parking that isn't designed for the wealthy people who are moving into these neighborhoods? Secondly, I'm going to be a little bit selfish here. My wife has to use a walker most of the time. And this uh, parking garage fiasco and, and having to ride a tram to wherever we want to go to be dropped off in the park just won't get it. Uh, she, she has to really struggle with that thing. And I have to help her, of course. She's 79, I'm 80. We're not going to be using it much longer, but I have used it, we have used it, since 1958. And she used it before then, but I, I came in from Alabama and I thought it was the greatest park I'd ever seen. However, it seems to me that there's something else afoot here, and, and I just hope it's not true, and that's this parking garage. I, I don't know how much the land would cost to develop a parking garage on it. I don't know how much it would cost to develop the parking garage, but it seems to me that the only one who will benefit from this parking garage is the landowners and the contractor. So I really hope you, you step back, think about this, and use the money that it would take to develop the parking garage and to buy the land to put it on and use that to get rid of the uh, invasive plants. You people should have been doing that all along anyhow. So, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 it's, a rather, it's a rather beautiful park just to drive through. It, it, it brings about a, a, a calming effect. Now, I played ball at home the diamonds there uh, back when I was a young man. And I, I, I don't know where you're going, what you're going to do with those. I don't know what you're going to do with the Joshi Pavilion, the Kohler Pavilion. What about the people on the west side and the south side and the east side that want to have a picnic at one of those things and they can't pull in there and park? Uh, what about the people on the, in those areas of town who are struggling to make it and want to have a day at the park and they get out there and they have to pay to park and you know you're going to have to pay and more than likely that tram is going to cost also but uh i just i just hope you rethink this thing and i'll leave you with one thought if it ain't broke don't fix it i want to address process number one i don't know who these comments are going to be uh, taken to usually there's a board there's a committee there's a city council and we come and we give our information to them and then it goes for something. Where are, is somebody taking, you said notes, uh, is it being recorded? And how is all this going to get to our city council members who eventually will be making a decision? That's a very big question I have. Number two, this uh, process was started in a vacuum, I believe, on um, line 11 of the master plan that's on, on, online. It states that, that this master plan was developed after listening to stakeholders. Well, the, com the community, the larger community, did not even know about it. So I don't know who the stakeholders are. I understand that some of them are the neighbors, Incarnate Word. Um, who, who am I talking to? Am I talking to you? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. Uh, Incarnate Word, uh, San Antonio Independent School District. I think the people that of um, River Road are certainly neighbors, people in Terrell Hills, people in other areas, and I respect that they live very close. But as has been said already, this is a community park. It belongs to everybody. And since I found out that we were going to be having these hearings, I've been going to the park myself. I go on Sunday afternoons, sometimes during the week. There's always people there. 
I made a copy of the of the tram, of the road of the tram. So I tell people that one of the things that's gonna happen is that there probably will be parking garages and there's gonna be a trenecito, you know, a little train to take them inside. And right away they say, well, how are we supposed to have our picnics here? You know, we come on Easter, we come during the week, we come for our piñatas. It's almost a tradition. Uh, I saw this lady, she says, every child in their family for their first birthday, they have a piñata in Brackenridge Park. Uh, and to me, uh, the, the users, all the users of the park should have been taken into consideration. Uh, you mentioned the five um, strategies, um, and, and they're fine, but nowhere does it say who, are, who the users are. Usually, you investigate who goes there, who uses it, and do you want to keep them there? Because very frankly, when I tell people what's happening, summarize what I know to be the plan, what they tell me, many of them, no se están echando, señora. They're kicking us out. They don't want us to do this anymore. And this is coming from people. I've seen senior citizens, uh, they are on Sunday walking their, their pets. I've seen uh, large families having their picnics on Sundays, on, uh, even after, after work in the evening. And I think that I'm worried that we schedule these public hearings and they're going to go for naught. That the plans will continue uh, because it's, it's not set in, in stone, as I hear. And when something is not set in stone, it's, it, it can be changed. I hope that you go back to the drawing board and that you postpone the presentation to the city council because I don't know what process you're going to use to change things, being that you've heard all these things uh, at the hearing. I'm very concerned that we, we, we came, uh, we're going to share information, and that it's not going to go anywhere. So um, I am asking you, Mr. Olivia, to please take that message to uh, to the people. Well, can we hear his answer, though? Can we hear your answer? Well, I'll restate what I said earlier, that we we're grabbing all the information, and what we would present to council would be everything that we heard. So a consensus from, so for example, when we go to report to the council committee, we would, if the, if the plan from the, the, the consultants, for example, that say the consultants feel strongly and they say they recommend this professionally. Then I, as a parks director, would come back and tell council, this is what the consultants are saying, but this is what the community is saying. So it's not in a vacuum, it's we would present that to a council committee, and the council committee see, would, then, would then direct us, we need you to go back and incorporate more, or to change this or not change that. So all that would happen before anything's ever even adopted, and then much less ever funded or implemented because there's a whole other process for implementation when people talk about which company what color that's like a project so you know when we have our bond programs we have community meetings you know what do you want to see what color what do you want it to feel like we're not even talking about that that's a whole another layer once something is actually funded so this is purely just a plan a vision statement a vision document and then that's what we would present to council is we would, we're going we're to compile all the information for all the meetings and share that with them. So okay, so my answer, my answer is that the consultants that were hired do not have to listen to what the people said. I, I, I cannot say that they have to. I mean, again, I think what we're looking at is the consultants are making their, opinion, their professional recommendations, but again, we, we have an opportunity, staff will weigh in, and then we will provide the information for the public as well. And if you're taking the information to them, yes, ma'am. Too, we're sharing it with the consultants, and we're taking it to council, the council committee, and then I can get. Are we going to get a copy? Of so I can summarize. So that would be available because when we present to council, all that information is available to the public, so you'll be able to see that. And we can answer. I don't want you know interrupt everyone else's time. I can answer more detailed questions, but we're nowhere close for anything being anywhere completed. The so. Yes, ma'am, ma'am. I mentioned them right in the very beginning. There's the name over there. Can you introduce them? Sure. We have Jim Gray, who's the principal. Uh, and then we have, I'm sorry, I'm my mind's on blank. I'd like to thank you, Maria, that we worked together in 2002. I yeah, too. Uh, I know a lot about the park, too. And, it, and a very sympathetic to what I'm hearing tonight. I want you all to know that, that we're listening. One of the hallmarks of our firm's reputation is that we listen. And we're going to do the right thing for San Antonio. Which firm is it? My, my firm name, uh, firm's name is Rialto Studio. 
office, or my office is at 24, my office is at 24. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. I'm sorry, my, my office is at 2425 Broadway. You recognize that address? The mm -hmm. here, um, right in front of the Brackenridge Golf Course. My name is Jim Gray, G-R-A-Y, telephone number 226, no, I'm sorry, 828-1155. Glad to hear from you. Who are all the other consultants? You said consultants. I'd like to just take you back very quickly to the process. I attended the first meeting at the Botanical Gardens where we got the, the information, where we received the information from Paige Dawson and Alamo Architects, as well as, as our facilitator. And it sounded to all of us that were there that it was a done deal. So then after that, uh, Marina Antonieta de Osaba put the editorial in the paper. There was a special uh, edition of La Voz that went out to the community, giving information on all of this. And the thing is, you know, uh, First of all, it, it just rankled me because it, it had all of the smackings of, of patronismo. And again, to remind people what patronismo is, because we grew up with it, is to have people say, we know what's best for you. You don't decide, we know what's best for you. And, and this is what the idea was at the time that I received. Now, talking about the Grand Lawn, you know, uh, and it was explained at the meeting at the Botanical Gardens that it would be open for venues and concerts and things. We have that already at the Sunken Garden Theater. It just needs to be reconfigured, it needs to be redone, but we've got that already. We're in South Texas. We don't need Grand Lawns. <laughs> We need trees. People will go and gravitate towards trees under La Resolana or the shades of trees. But that's what we need, more trees. In addition to, to the trees, one of the things that we need in the park itself, in the woodland areas, are you aware of all of the trees that are dying? We need to have a serious infill project of the trees in all of these wooded areas because they're all dying. Also, uh, you mentioned that presentations were made to neighborhood associations. Well, I'm the current chair of the River Road Neighborhood Association. We didn't have this presentation. And this is our backyard. We, we see Brackenridge Park as our backyard. We're in and out of there all the time. And it's not, as was stated in the last meeting, um, it's used as a shortcut. No, we're in and out of the park all the time because we enjoy the park. 